Our last video showed the value of treating recurring nightmares separately from associated daytime problems. This same principle of treating specific sleep problems separately from other problems can also help us to cope with other sleep disorders. For instance, consider sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is a condition in which the sleeper stops breathing repeatedly for 10 seconds or more. In many cases, Treating sleep apnea, besides improving the quality of sleep, has also had the effect of reducing recurring nightmares and even diminishing associated daytime symptoms of anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder. Theoretically, that's not hard to explain. Apnea, whether caused by airway blockage or brain regulation problems, stops the victim from breathing. Our graphic shows the most common form which is caused by airway blockage and is known as obstructive sleep apnea. In any case, when the victim stops breathing, this deprives the body of oxygen and alerts the brain to a little crisis. The little crisis is generally overcome but typically recurs spasmodically for prolonged periods throughout the night. Depending on how things go, we can easily imagine these recurrent crises rousing both emotional fears and the amygdala, circumstances that encourage nightmares. These nightmares, alone or in combination with the apnea, diminish the quality of sleep and end by awakening the sleeper. Within this context, treating sleep apnea associated with other ailments may do more than just reduce the apnea. In some cases, it may reduce nightmares, assist nighttime memory processing, raise the quality of sleep, and improve the sleeper's general situation around the clock. We now know that nighttime memory processing is vital to human welfare, and this fact impels us toward a couple of general rules for confronting sleep disorders that are associated with other ailments. First, we need to recognize that sleep disorders interfering with nighttime memory processing can have a significant impact on conditions like PTSD, anxiety, or depression. So it's worth treating sleep disorders not just to deal with these disorders, but also to help deal with other things. Second, current wisdom suggests that wherever possible it pays to treat a sleep disorder on its own independently of other sleep disorders and independently of daytime problems. For example, suppose a person is suffering from nightmares and depression. Then, according to this approach, don't just treat the depression. Instead, regard the nightmares as a separate though related disorder that may go to the heart of the problem and devise a specific strategy to treat it. Or, if a PTSD victim is suffering from daytime PTSD symptoms, apnea, and recurring nightmares, don't just treat the daytime symptoms and hope the nighttime symptoms will vanish. They often won't. Instead, regard the apnea and nightmares as separate clinical entities and devise strategies for treating both. In this way, the victim's general problem can be tackled from two or more directions rather than just one. There may be exceptions to these rules as each person is different and some medical treatments or therapies may conflict with others. And as we shall see, certain sleep disorders may not fit this general picture. But there is no doubt that many sleep disorders can affect nighttime memory processing and sleep quality and can thereby have a major impact upon our daytime lives. Nor is there any doubt that separate treatment of these disorders can at times yield major benefits, reducing both nighttime problems and daytime ills. Let's see how all this relates to insomnia. Insomnia, literally lack of sleep, is a catch-all term for trouble falling asleep or staying asleep to a point where it produces daytime distress or impairs daytime activities. If this problem persists most nights for a month or more, it is called chronic insomnia. Chronic insomnia afflicts lots of people. Indeed, 10 to 15 percent of all adults report having had chronic insomnia at one time or another. But in 9 out of 10 cases, the problem is associated with some other disorder, 
post-traumatic stress disorder, recurring nightmares, anxiety, depression, obesity, hypertension, and congestive heart failure, among others. So should one treat the insomnia, or the associated disorder, or both? There seems good reason in many cases to treat both, considering the insomnia as a separate clinical entity and customizing treatment to take account of the patient's specific needs and circumstances. Medicines have long been used to treat insomnia, and in some cases they work to a degree. But we are coming to understand that certain kinds of behavioral psychotherapy generally work better. Two kinds of therapy are commonly combined. One, called sleep restriction, seeks to consolidate sleep by reducing the patient's time in bed to match actual sleep time. The other, called stimulus control, tries to make the sleep-wake cycle regular, to promote bedtime routines that foster sleep, and to reduce tension at bedtime through relaxation techniques. If properly applied, these sorts of therapy commonly cut the extent of chronic insomnia symptoms in half. And since reducing insomnia can improve the patient's circumstances around the clock, that by itself can improve the prospects for dealing with associated problems. This means that in many cases, almost irrespective of the success one is having with the associated problems, treatment of insomnia is worth doing. This brings me to the end of this video. I recognize that the list of sleep disorders is long and that not all can be covered in a series of short presentations such as this. However, there are a few that are quite common and that typically arise not during REM sleep or sleep in general, but that arise during slow wave sleep. I'm referring to sleep terrors, sleep walking, and related matters. So our next video, the last in this sleep series, will focus upon them.